special overtime edition of Ring of Thunder. I mean, there's really nothing special about it, at least as far as overtime is concerned. It's just, you know, I seem to actually love getting it, which makes things run a little behind with this podcast, but always still on Monday, even though we're now like 12 minutes into whatever's going on on Monday Night Raw right now. But I got some good stuff for you that we'll, we'll just go over. And it starts with the, be, the return of the Viper, Randy Orton. He opened the show last week on Raw, and that man was all smiles. Those smiles were a shoot, I'll tell you. Because that was Randy's first time back in front of the WWE Universe when uh, since, uh, I guess, technically... April when he buried the fiend, dead and gone. But now he was here with a different mission because he was going to tell Matt Riddle, like, dude, you know, we teamed a little bit. It was cool, but I don't want to do it anymore. And that was what Riddle was just trying to tell him to be like, no, man, we could be a great team. We could be a great team. And Randy was like, nah, nah, nah. And then, of course... AJ Styles and Amos came out, and AJ had to taunt him and egg him on, and now he was pretty much right there ready to get him some tag titles. And of course, throughout the show, we had Riddle still trying to be buddy up, buddy up to him, and we've got a little video montage of the friendship of RK Bro so far. And then, yeah. <clears throat> in the main event Randy beat AJ and then he and Riddle were, were celebrating and then Randy hit an RKO on Riddle now you'd think that would be the moment that they would break up but they seem to be all good I mean this story still has plenty to play out with and also what's going to happen in the main event segment of this particular episode aka the wwe super show i went to i'll tell you about that in the second half of this podcast so pretty much raw was being raw so carrion cross finally got his win back against jeff hardy but we just took such a fucking path to get there i'm just like cool yay okay and then over on Impact, Impact, huh, some weird stuff was happening, which is like, with Impact, it's like, well, when, is that, when does that not happen? And it started with Kira Hogan coming to the ring because she wanted to face Tasha Steeles and, you know, get some answers and probably some revenge for Tasha Steeles having Savannah Evans wallop her all over the place. Yeah, that's a bit of an exaggeration. Savannah Evans just knocked her right the fuck out. <clears throat> but anyway, so she wanted some answers. But instead of Tasha and Savannah coming to the ring, it was Sue Young and Kimberly. Huh. So pretty much Sue was just standing right there at the entrance Kimberly came into the um, the ring all zombified or undead and shit. And apparently Sue was controlling her actions because there was a because Kimber mimicked Sue raising up her hand and putting on that bloody glove for the mandible claw. And then of course she hit Kiera Hogan with the mandible claw and then just dragged her off into the mist. The Undead Realm, the Abyss, whatever you want to call it. So who knows what's going on with that. Except it's interesting because tonight on AEW Dark Elevation, Hikaru Shida is going to be going one-on-one -on -one with Kiera Hogan. So, uh, huh. And I asked this before, but I was just... <clears throat> but now I'm really starting to think, like... So when Su Young actually, like quote-unquote kills these women and all that or you know takes them to whatever 
does she take them directly to AEW or does Tony Khan just rescue them from there? Because my, if you remember, yeah, you know, Allie, she was an impact. She was the team of demon money with Rosemary. And then Sue Young used the Freddy, the flying Freddy Krueger glove to stab Allie. And then Allie died in Rosemary's arms. And then, <clears throat> months later, Allie shows up in AEW, which I know everybody's still waiting for the whole Bunny, Rosemary, Demon Bunny reunion to happen now that the whole Forbidden Door is open. I mean, not only have I been pondering it and asking about it on this podcast, but even when Allie was on AEW Unrestricted podcast. One of the Twitter questions was about like, hey, if uh, Bunny and Rosemary ever had a re reunion, would they be going against each other or would they be reuniting at the tag team or something along those lines? So, you know, people want to see this. And it's just a little weird to me that they would do it again like this because... <clears throat> When they did that with Allie, of course, there was the the forbidden door was pretty strong. So we knew Impact and AEW were in its separate worlds. There was no crisscross or mishmash or whatever. But now, of course, the forbidden door I don't even think exists anymore, except maybe between WWE and everywhere else. Okay, let me say this. WWE and everywhere else, including NXT. So, I mean, hey, who knows? We'll see what else they can pull out of there. But we'll get on to Rampage, and Rampage now very much crossing over with the Impact stuff in a bit. But of course, over the weekend, there was New Japan Resurgence or NJPW Strong Resurgence, and also Triple Mania, which is Triple A's big show. Not Triple H's big show, but Triple A's big show. And <clears throat> we're not going to get into the results of all of that, but, and I'm just Googling the Never Open Weight Championship right here as we are talking. But Jay White did retain against David Finley. At least I'm hoping so. I hope Google's not lying to me. And also, for sure that I do know, Hiroshi Tanahashi actually defeated Lance Archer to become the IWGP champion. I... I... Uh, but, the IWGP United States champion. Jeez, pay attention, Adam. And then... Yeah, Lance Archer was just like, Hey, you, whenever you want to do a rematch, I'd like to do it in an AEW arena. So, either which way, I guess we're getting Tanahashi in AEW soon, but... <clears throat> I'd rather see him versus John Moxley in All Out. But, I mean, if they want to have Tanahashi versus Archer and Tanahashi versus Moxley, both on AEW television, I'm not going to argue with you right there. That sounds like great TV to me. And over in Triple Mania, Kenny Omega retained the Triple A Mega Championship against Andrade. And Kenny actually had Conan in his corner, while Andrade has his future father-in-law, Ric Flair, in his corner. And if you can believe it, we actually live in a world now where Ric Flair has chopped Kenny Omega in a wrestling ring. Because, you know, time is a human concept and just goes far and way beyond a wrestling ring. Of course, good to see. Hopefully that means Ric Flair has no non-compete waiting period after all. Because 
it'd be great to see him in AEW sooner rather than later or wherever he wishes to go. He is the GOAT, so he can do whatever he wants. But it was cool to see him hanging with his future son-in-law and you know getting to do more stuff than just occasionally sort of blunder in Charlotte's way. Or, you know, partnering up with Lacey Evans. That's over, thank goodness. And also, Deanna Parazzo won the Reina de Reinas Women's Championship in during Triple Mania. So now she is a double champ because she is a champion, Reina de Reinas, on, on also, of course, still your knockouts champion. And the storyline between her and Melina leading up to Empower is still building. And this Thursday on Impact, Melina will actually be making her Impact Wrestling in-ring debut. So all sorts of exciting cross-pollination around. And of course, don't forget, NWA Empower, the all-women's pay-per-view, is August 28th at 8. So you have plenty of time to watch it. After you go watch Pro Wrestling Turbo Overdrive, baby. That's going to be... That should be a fun day of wrestling. I know for me, I have something to do in between that. But I'm absolutely going to get home as soon as I possibly can and start watching Empower. And then the next day is going to be NWA 73. From the Chase Ballroom. So on to SmackDown, my absolute favorite thing is this Roman versus Cena program. Probably because now they got into their own war of words and Roman came a little more prepared than 2017. Because, <clears throat> I mean, you know, going after... Or, Name dropping someone's ex in a promo battle in between them is kind of like too easy. You know, that's kind of like when I've talked about this before too. When when Randy Orton is feuding with an opponent and they shoot on him and they're like, "Oh, R Randy Orton doesn't care and he's lazy." Blah blah blah. And Randy Orton's just, you know, cruising through this. I think like going after exes in general is kind of like that. But still, got to hand it to Roman, our wonderful tri wonderful tribal chief. It, it pretty much made me go, oh, when he was just like 20 plus missionary or 20 plus years of missionary may have been good for you, but apparently wasn't good for Nikki Bella. It's like, oh, shit. And then Cena was just like, well, you, for you, you almost ruined Seth Rollins' career and you ran Dean Ambrose out of WWE. It was like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that, that was like the first mention of Dean Ambrose, actually, since, of course, he left WWE. I mean, shit, I mean... Renee had her baby some months ago. They congratulated her on WWE.com, but literally made no mention of John Moxley slash Dean Ambrose slash John Good. Like, oof. But now, now John Cena is just like, you know, ran Dean Ambrose out of WWE. <sighs> I mean, if anything, Roman almost probably almost persuaded him to stay if there was ever a chance that he might stay. Then Roman tried to capitalize on it, having that cool little shield reunion and finally getting Dean back to be babyface after the whole all these people stink in our disease and I'm going to wear a gas mask and get a shot in my butt segment. God, that was just... That was just horrible. More people than me needed Raw Lanta, and that's just a fact. And then, sure enough, after 
Baron Corbin lost to Kevin Owens, who said if Corbin won, he would give him, what do you say, like $1,000? But of course, Corbin lost, and then KO gave him a stunner one more time, and then Caleb Braxton was cornering Corbin for an interview, and he was talking, and then he looked off towards off camera and then he actually went and stole Biggie's money in the bank briefcase so they're going to be very 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 interesting to see where that goes and a couple things over on NXT um Indy Hartwell and Dexter Loomis went on their date throughout the show it seemed to go as well as it could even though Johnny and Candace were trying all sorts of different ways of spying at them, like Candace holding a menu in front of her face while sitting at a separate table while doing reconnaissance with Johnny, and then Johnny posing as their waiter, and then the cake crashing into Dexter's face. So Indy was going to eat that cake, and she put her hand in front of the camera. Just, you know, typical comedic. I don't want my daughter to date this boy, so I'm going to spy on her stuff. Which, it's all good fun. Pretty damn hilarious. And now on Twitter, Robert Stone's trying to come up with a fake dating profile to try to ruin Index. Like, come on, man, what's the matter with you? And then we got the stipulations for the Adam Cole-Kyle O'Reilly 3 match going to happen at uh, TakeOver. It's going to be 2 out of 3 falls. The first fall is just going to be a straight-up wrestling match. That was chosen by Kyle O'Reilly because he knew it would absolutely crush Adam Cole if Kyle could beat him in just a straight-up wrestling match. And I believe the second stipulation was a street fight chosen by Adam Cole. So I guess he wants no restrictions. And then William Regal chose, if necessary, the third fall will be in a steel cage. Just a regular steel cage match. Which I'm pretty sure those are the exact same stipulations for the two out of three falls between Johnny Gargano and Adam Cole at TakeOver in New York 2019. But I could be wrong and or just a little error about that. I don't know, but this one should be quite fun. It's just too bad they're not doing it at whatever sort of arena is that is in Las Vegas, like, indoor arena near Allegiant Stadium. You know, like how we used to do takeovers. And then on <clears throat> Friday was the premiere of AEW Rampage. And it started out with, if you could believe it, Christian Cage defeating Kenny Omega to become the Impact World Champion. And that's the put some seeds of hmm in your mind that huh, can Christian actually beat Kenny Omega at all out for the AEW championship, which he won't, but holy shit, we are now living in a world where not only is Christian an active wrestler again, but he's also a champion. And Christian Cage will be appearing on th Impact this Thursday, of course. So, yeah, I'm sure the guys in the Impact locker room the current guys wanted to be the one to take the belt off Kenny Omega but hey some Christian Cage is definitely the hero we need but not the hero we were expecting and also the middle match of Rampage because Rampage is only an hour thank goodness of uh, Fuego del Sol versus Miro for the TNT championship I can't remember what I was doing. I was doing something. No, I think I was paying maybe not my phone bill. I was either paying something or looking at something real quick. And then I was going to pay attention to this match. But yeah, Miro definitely squashed Fuego del Sol. And also part of the stipulation was this, that if Fuego wins, he gets an AEW contract. He didn't win. However, afterwards, Tony Khan and Sammy Guevara came out. And Tony handed Sammy something, and Sammy went into the ring. He was pretty much like, you know, you didn't win, but I love you. You're my best friend. 
the fans love you, more people in the back love you than you even know. Like it's so it's my pleasure to say this, Fuego del Sol is all elite. And Fuego got his contract anyway. And you know what? That's fine with me. Especially because it wasn't like the Drake Maverick storyline where they were kind of shooting on during a time where people were where a lot of people were out of a job. So there wasn't that question of, oh, are they doing this as part of a storyline? No, Fuego had already always been like outside sort of enhancement talent who works with AEW but isn't a part of AEW and fans have been clamoring for him to get signed. So, you know, he got signed. He's now all elite. And then the main event was Britt Baker defeating Red Velvet in Britsburg to retain the AEW Women's Championship. And then after that, uh, she was attacking Red Velvet, and then Chris Statlander came out to protect Red Velvet and attack Britt. And then Statlander was attacked by Jamie Hayter, who's returned for the first time in a couple of years, just about. And apparently she is a part of the DMD team. So quite a lot of wrestling and only in just even more to come up. Then when we get back, I'll tell you all about the old house show in Charlotte, North Carolina. Check out what's been going on with the Pop Culture Cosmo Show and the PCC Multiverse. I would say that E3 maybe isn't the event that it once was, but everybody still plans their event around the E3 schedule. Steven Spielberg could throw out a gum commercial and we'd all watch it because it's Steven Spielberg. Dragon Age 4 is carrying, I think, the future of Bioware on its shoulders. That's the Pop Culture Cosmo Show. And the PCC Multiverse. Catch our shows on Worldwide Radio seven days a week and right here on the ESO Network. How did watchdog groups with no experience in television take a controlling interest on Saturday morning television? When did Wonder Woman make her animated debut? Want to know why there were two competing Ghostbuster shows? How Atari changed the Saturday morning landscape. How did networks compete over similar genres at the same time? Find out all of this and more on the Best Saturdays of Our Lives podcast. A proud member of the ESO Network. Hello. Have you ever wondered how much Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster sold Superman's rights to DC for? Or which uh, popular football star was uh, the Sam Wilson the Falcons physical appearance based on? You can find all that and more at the History of Comic Books podcast, a podcast dedicated to the creators, events, history, and the companies that made the great comic book medium. Hosted and created by your friendly neighborhood, J.T. Wheatley. Please listen, give it a listen at iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, and all our podcasting platforms. Thank you, and go ahead and enjoy yourself a good comic book. Hey guys, gals, and non-binary pals. It's Amanda Bones. And I'm Ashley. Of How to Talk to Your Friend About Wrestling, the podcast on the Count Out Wrestling Podcast Network, a weekly show where we talk about all of our favorite things, babes, blood, and brutality. We also talk about other fun things, like is Kenny Omega finally too tan? And how much blood is too much blood? Because that looks like way too much blood. <laughs> so join us on the adventure of teaching me, Amanda Bones, about wrestling. Do you like podcasts? Then you're going to hate Thunder Talk. Tasteless subject matter. Mature humor. Contempt for our co-hosts. Unapologetic social views. Edgy music. And total irreverence for the nerd junk we love. Are all reasons why no one. No one. No one should listen to Thunder Talk. Find us on the ESO Network. And all podcasting platforms. Or don't. Whatever. So last Saturday, myself and Nick went up to the old Charlotte, North Carolina to go see the WWE Live Super Show. And I'm telling you, if you've never been to a house show for WWE or just wrestling in general, you got to do it because it's a lot of fun. Sometimes it's even better than the fucking TV tapings, depending on what it is. Like that raw in December. I mean, aside from Becky going two on one and against the Kabuki Warriors and Seth turning heel, overall, 
last Saturday's show was much better than that, honestly. But yeah, the house show started off with Byron Saxon welcoming the WWE Universe and also informing us that due to unforeseen circumstances, Sasha Banks and Bianca Belair will not be in attendance. So interesting what's happening there, especially after we left from SmackDown, was the contract signing between Sasha and Bianca. And turns out Sasha has Carmella and Zelina Vega on her side. Either it's a new faction or just simply the enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of thing. I mean, they're heels, of course. It's probably just that. And then let's start off with Finn Balor defeating Baron Corbin, who was chased off by Big E. And so very cool to see a storyline that started yesterday actually happening. And then Big E defeated Seth Rollins. And then Big E introduced the New Day. And then the Hurt Business beat the New Day. Damian Priest versus Sheamus for the United States Championship was happening, which ended in a disqualification because it's a match involving Raw superstars, of course. So Jinder attacked Damian Priest, and Drew McIntyre made the save. And then there was a tag team match of Damian Priest and Drew McIntyre versus Sheamus and Jinder Mahal, which, yeah, give me that all day. And it ended with Damian Priest pinning Sheamus, the United States champion. So I guess Priest is still the number one contender leading up to SummerSlam. Then Nikki A.S.H. defeated Rhea Ripley with the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll-up, to retain the Raw Women's Championship. And AJ Styles and Omos defeated RK Bro, who were very much friendly and in cahoots, which I felt was a bit of a... Spoiler, considering where we were at on Monday with Randy hitting uh, Riddle with the RKO, but also everybody was just very happy to see RK bro together. And then, of course, after that match, AJ Styles received an RKO anyway. And then the main event, and I was trying to remember, because no, I did not write it down as uh, it was happening, but I remembered as much as I could. The main event was the Bloodline, Roman and the Usos versus John Cena and Ray and Dominic Mysterio. And you're damn right I cheered the heels. I mean, hey, pretty much most of that arena during the Raw Women's Championship was chanting for Charlotte to come out. So, you know, this is me getting even with that. I mean, I don't have a problem with Charlotte at all. I like Charlotte. I'm just a Becky Mark. I mean, hello, you know this already. And, of course, Roman hit everybody with a Superman punch. I was about to spear Cena, but Cena got out the way. Then he hit... Did he hit... I think he hit Roman and then hit Jay, who was the legal man, with the attitude adjustment. Got the one, two, three, and everybody was like, yay. And I was like, ugh. I was like, I'll remember this next Saturday, Cena. Because Cena even said it himself. He said he was going to get his ass kicked. Except he also said he was going to get the one, two, three on Roman, which is not going to be happening. So, yeah. And and even on our way back, swinging by a QT, this one guy was just like, Cena's going to kick his ass on Saturday. Which I'm just thinking, get out of here. But yeah, so that was my time at the house show. It was awesome. Got myself an Acknowledge Me shirt. Got myself my first Sasha Banks shirt. And it's her with that really cool blue and green hair she had at WrestleMania this year. (sighs) And Spectrum Center was very nice. I mean, I love State Farm Arena and just the whole city of Atlanta just that much more. But... The Spectrum Center was a very nice arena. Downtown Charlotte was actually very pretty. Uh, Me and Nick both did a double take when we saw Truest Field, apparently home to the Charlotte Knights. And we're just like, what? what?" I mean, Truest Park all the way, Atlanta Braves, baby. But, you know, 
Respect. A lot of respect. It was flair. We were in flair country. We had ourselves a good time. Of course, it is also our truth in Cedric Alexander country as well. Got to acknowledge that. Just like I got to acknowledge my tribal chief in person. Because he said, Charlotte, acknowledge me. I was just like, yeah. Because... He is acknowledged as the tribal chief, the head of the table, the end all be all, you know the rest. But anyways, I'm about to turn this off so I can go watch some Raw now and also pardon the interruption if there was like a, if you noticed any sort of difference halfway through or I repeated a result during the whole talk about the house show, there was some outside interruption, but you know, that's what happens on the Ring of Thunder. Guess what? I ain't editing it out because I ain't got time for that. And that's one, two, three. Thanks for locking up with me in the Ring of Thunder. Kick butts, not nuts. Welcome to Dr. Geek's Laboratory. Hello, everyone. Dr. Geek here with a shout out to all the scientists who worked tirelessly to bring a COVID-19 vaccine into reality. <laughs> Let's face it. Creating something of this magnitude is a miracle worthy of Dr. McCoy himself. And now, Dr. Geek needs you to do your part. Remember, each shot is one small step back to normal, one giant leap to putting the pandemic behind us. We can do this. For more information, visit vaccines.gov to find your nearest provider. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.